Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you, and uh, it's just sad to see our nation spiraling down, turning its back on you. And uh, it's not the first assassination attempt or the first, uh, you know, attempt to take out a president. But Lord, uh, these days are just violent. Uh, we see wickedness throughout the world. Uh, we just pray for um, those who lost their uh, loved one yesterday that was killed there at the rally. We pray for the family. I don't know if the guy knew you or not, but we ask, Lord, that you would use this to draw many people to you. Um, I pray, Father, that, uh, you know, President Trump would, you know, keep acknowledging the fact that you watched over him and that he would draw near to you. And so, Lord, we pray for our country. We just pray that you would open up eyes to see their need for Jesus. Uh, we pray for Israel. Pray that many in Israel would see their need for their Messiah, Jesus. And Lord, we just ask that you would uh, minister to each one of us, help us to be light and salt in this world. And as we look at this section of Scripture in Acts chapter 2, may we also, like Peter, be filled up overflowing with your Spirit so we can be a bold witness of your goodness, your grace, and the salvation that you freely offer to anyone who will come to you by faith. And so we commit this time to you now and ask that you would be high and lifted up in our lives, in this country, and more and more people would start looking to you. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like, well, like you say in your word, in the last days, men's hearts are going to go from bad to worse. And so we just pray that we would be that light and salt uh, as long as you keep us here. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So turn to Acts chapter 2. Um, as you're turning there this Wednesday night, um, we're looking at the two chapters in the Distinctives book, having begun in the spirit and the supremacy of love, um, the very appropriate chapters for where we are today in the scriptures, but also where we are in our lives as believers. Um, uh, Bethany wanted to let people know next, uh, two weeks from yesterday, they're doing Cowboy Up, a uh, free concert down there in Ridgeway, and then Carl Mecklenburg uh, is going to be the main speaker down there, so that's a free concert outreach, so uh, there's info in the uh, information booth, there's more information about Cowboy Up. So, Acts chapter 2, we started off looking at the first 13 verses last week. We saw that the day of Pentecost had fully come, meaning that the full reason why Pentecost was established is come to fruition for 1,500 years. They celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, uh, you know, the first fruits of the harvest. Well, this is the fulfillment of it on the, the day when 3,000 Jews will become the first followers of Jesus Christ after the gospel is preached. Uh, it says they, 120 were gathered in the upper room. We saw in verse... Two, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse 3, it says, There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. It sat upon each one of them. Verse 4 says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And as the disciples came outside as they're praising the Lord. It says the multitudes of people, because, you know, Jerusalem goes from, on these three major feast days, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, a city of 250,000 would quickly grow to about two and a half million for those required feast days. So they're all gathered there at the temple. As they come out of the temple area, they're, you know, praising the Lord, and the people say, they're speaking the wonderful works of God in these various languages. Uh, again, there's people from all over the Roman Empire, these Jews that have been scattered or there for the feast days, and they're just blown away as they hear in their native tongues these different uh, praises of the Lord. So we saw in verse 12, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, they're full of new wine. And so, you know, the people are just like, what in the world's going on here? You know, it's nine o'clock in the morning. There's nobody that happy in Jerusalem at nine o'clock in the morning. Some are saying, oh, that's because they're drunk. And, and, and we'll see in a moment that Peter will say, no, this is what's going on here. Unfortunately, unbelievers will always mock a spirit-filled Christian. If you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, 
whether you're in your neighborhood or at work or wherever you might be, and you're proclaiming the love of Jesus, the salvation that's freely given in Christ, you'll have people that'll mock you. Fortunately, there's some, like we'll see here, they're drawn to that. They want to know what's going on. We want to hear more about why you have such joy. But the majority of people, they don't want to hear it. You know, they'll think, oh, you're just a fanatic. You're just crazy. You know, you're just, you know, a lunatic. And it's no problem for 75,000 people to show up at Mile High Stadium, painted blue and orange, screaming their heads off for three hours. Oh, that they're just, you know, fans. You know, they're, they're just really excited. They've got passion for their team. But if a Christian has passion for Jesus, you know, people get upset. Now, when we shine the light, when we share the truth of Christ, we need to wait for those open doors. When the doors are open, Make sure you let people know this is the reason why we have joy. It's because of Jesus. Now, when Christians express joy, when they express delight in the Lord, you know, even some Christians will say, well, you're just going, you know, you're getting too weird. You're going over the top. Be careful. You know, we want to be those who point people to Christ. We want to be those who talk about the wonderful works of God. Um, you know, we see examples in the scriptures when Paul is proclaiming the gospel to King Agrippa later on in chapter 26, you know, he's just going forward, telling him his testimony and how Jesus is raised from the dead and so forth. And King Agrippa says, Paul, you're out of your mind. You know, you're beside yourself and you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul says, not only you, I wish everybody that's hearing this would become followers of Jesus. We remember uh, when King David was finally allowed to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. The Philistines had captured it. It was seven months in Philistine areas, and they kept moving it around, and God was giving them plagues. So they sent it to Kirjath Jerem, a, a Jewish town, and it stayed there for 20 years. And then when David finally gets the okay to bring it into Jerusalem, they're doing it the right way, carrying it, not carting it. Uh, they carried it in, and people are celebrating, they're worshiping, and David was dancing and singing and praising the Lord, playing music, and, and then there was his wife, Michelle Mybell. No, Michael. I don't know how you pronounce her name. It looks like Michael, but it was Michal. And anyway, she starts to mock him. Oh, you're looking like one of the commoners out there, David. You know, you're just being so over the top, and she's mocking him. And so we read in 2 Samuel 6.21, So David said to her, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father, that was King Saul, and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of, Israel, or people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore I will play music before the Lord. In other words, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm, I'm worshiping Him. Where It's a time to celebrate. And so... As a result of her mocking what God was doing, it says she became barren and she never had any children because she was quenching the Spirit. So we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. But that's what true worship is all about, getting your eyes off of people and focusing on Jesus. You know, getting your eyes off of the worship team and just looking to the Lord. And so that's what these 120 disciples are doing. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're praising God for His wonderful works. Now, notice how Peter responds to their question. You know, what's going on here? Whatever could this mean? You know, they're full of new wine. Well, look at verse 14. It says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day now again this is the new and improved peter 50 days earlier you go back to passover that's when jesus was arrested that's when he'd be crucified but that's when peter was denying jesus he was cursing i don't even know the man totally denying to even know have anything to do with jesus a little girl called him out and so here's 50 days later, now the Holy Spirit's in him, the Holy Spirit's upon him, and now he's proclaiming before literally hundreds of thousands of people gathered here around the temple and on the Temple Mount. And so, notice the self-control Peter has here. He comes out, he's speaking in tongues with the rest of them, proclaiming the mighty works of God, but then 
instantly he stops and he addresses them. And he starts to share what, what's going on here. He was not out of control. When you look at the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, that's very important. So some, you know, you see some of these Holy Ghost revival meetings and people will be totally out of control. And they'll be flopping around. They'll be doing crazy things. And you talk to them about, oh, I just couldn't help it. I had to. I mean, it was, I, I was trying to stop. A friend of mine years ago went to one of these meetings, and he got Velcroed to the floor, is how he described it, for three hours. And I, could, I tried to get up. I couldn't get up. And I was like, I don't know what spirit you were under, but that's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is self-control. And that's what we see here. He's speaking in tongues, but he immediately stops. You know, it wasn't like the Holy Spirit grabbed his tongue and he couldn't stop. He just started telling them what's going on here. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 32 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. In other words, this is, not, you know, when you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, when you're surrendering your life fully to Him, you're not going to be out of control, but you will be in perfect control. So just as quickly as Peter started speaking in tongues, he stops. We're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And so now the door is open for him to preach the gospel. Look at verse 16. He says, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so here's this uneducated untrained fisherman this is what the sadducees will later call him uh he, he's just a simple guy from galilee but he knows the scriptures he's going to quote here from joel chapter 2 he's going to quote from psalm 16 he's going to quote from psalm 110 i mean he knew the word of god and so this is very important if you want to be used by god then get into his word because the more you get into his word the word will get into you then god can use you to proclaim the truth of his word to those who need to hear it your faith is so important but how is your faith developed well romans 10 17 so then faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god you want your faith to increase don't say, Lord, I want my faith to increase, so just do all these signs and wonders. No, you want your faith to increase, get into the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You know, we just finished Exodus, and we saw throughout the book of Exodus, they had miracle after miracle every day of their lives. Manna from heaven, water from the rock. I mean, you just go through the whole litany of all the miracles God did, and they could not enter into the promised land. Why? Because of their unbelief. They saw every day a miracle, but they did not believe the word of the Lord because God told them, go into the land. I will give you the land. Wherever you put your feet, I'm going to give it to you. And they did not believe the word of the Lord. So if you want faith to grow, get into God's word. Now, immediately, Peter says, okay, you want an explanation for what's going on here? Here's the scriptures. Let me show you what the scriptures say. And again, and I can't stress this enough, we need to have scriptural basis for whatever we want to attribute to the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of stuff out there that people say, oh, it's the Holy Spirit, and it's not the Holy Spirit if it does not line up with the Word of God. Personally, I would not accept any supernatural experience that is not supported by God's Word because the Hindus experience supernatural phenomena. The Mormons, and they're building a temple out here on Horizon Drive, I can guarantee there's going to be a lot of spiritual stuff going on in there. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's very demonic. I've known temple Mormons that got saved, and they say, we saw all kinds of demonic, well, they didn't think it was demonic. We had dead relatives appear to us, and they told us, we're on the right path. And then they realized later, that's demon. That's demonic. I came out of a cult, Christian science. There's a lot of spiritual phenomena that takes place there. I mean, don't believe what the, the, the cults say. You have to go back to the Word of God because the Word of God is what we base our faith and trust on. Faith comes by hearing. I want to believe what God says, not what some other weird thing out there says. Uh, Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. 
in, in Matthew 24, 24, Jesus warns about lying signs and wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, the Antichrist is showing up with lying signs and wonders. It says to deceive possible, even the elect. I mean, that's what Jesus says. And so we got to be very careful. There's a lot of things out there that are not of the Lord. Almost every cult that has ever been started came as a result of some supernatural revelation or an angelic visitation. That's why I call them phony Moroni. The angel Moroni supposedly showed up and told Joseph Smith, you know, all these religions are wrong. Which one should I join? None of them. They're all wrong. I'm going to start a new religion through you. That's not the Lord. That was a demonic being, if anything, or if possibly he's just making stuff up because he made up a lot of stuff as well. But be that as it may, we have to stay within the parameters of God's word, his written word. And that now not only goes for spiritual experiences, which I highly believe in. I've experienced a lot of things from the Lord, you know, directly in my life. But you have to have biblical basis for these things. We must also stay within the parameters of God's word as far as doctrine is concerned, because people come up with all kinds of strange new winds of doctrine. And it's like, hey, I've seen something nobody else has seen before. Well, probably because it's not true. I've discovered something in the Bible. Nobody's ever seen this. Well, you know, it was Chuck Missler that said years ago, you know, that the Old Testament, or no, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, but the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. He would say things like, if it's new, it's probably not true. If it's true, it's probably not new. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. We've got to always go back to God's word as the final authority. Again, Satan loves to bring out lies, deception, because he's trying to distract you and lead you down a path, you know, some bunny trail. But the revealed word of God is what we need to hold on to. Um, Paul's very clear. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul says, If we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. You know, it's another gospel that Moroni gave Joseph Smith, if it was indeed an angel that appeared to him. What is the gospel? It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Jesus died for our sins. That's first and foremost. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's what the gospel is. He died for us. He paid the price that we could never pay. He shed his blood as the only acceptable payment for our sins. Yes, he was dead. They buried him. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He conquered the grave. And that's why it's good news, because he alone can offer the free gift of salvation to anyone who will come to him by faith. A dead Messiah could not do anything for anybody. But Jesus conquered the grave, and that's why it's good news. That's why it's the gospel, and we need to hold fast to that. So here, Peter immediately explains what's going on. He's going to quote from the prophet Joel. And so he's saying, this is what Joel the prophet said. This is what's going on here. Look at verse 17. This is from Joel chapter 2. And it came, it shall come to pass in the last days. So the last days started here on the day of Pentecost, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I guess that's what I'm doing more lately, old men dreaming dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. So again, when God told Joel, I will pour out my spirit in those days, Peter's saying, this is the day, this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, just as God's word proclaimed. This is for your sons. This is for your daughters. This is for, you know, young, young men and old men, from men servants, maid servants. In other words, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is for everyone who receives Jesus as their Lord and Savior. These things didn't stop after the apostles died out. The outpouring of the Spirit is for all of us even today. Now, in verse 19 to 21, Peter quotes Joel to show that these manifestations are going to go from Pentecost to the second coming of Christ. 
Again, another proof text, these did not die out when the apostles died. Um, I like to use 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 10, where it says, For we know in part, presently, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So some cessationists, those who say the Spirit's not working today like he did back then, they try to use that verse to say the perfect refers to the Bible. Once we had the complete canonization of the Bible at the Council of Nicaea, then we don't need any of these gifts anymore. That's not what he's saying here. Paul's very clear. We know in part now, we prophesy in part now, but when that which is perfect has come, who's that? That's Jesus. When Jesus comes, then that which is in part will be done away. Because the very next thing he says is, for now we see through a glass dimly, but then face to face. Not face to face with the Bible, but face to face with Jesus. And that's when we won't need the gifts anymore because we will be in the fullness of his presence. Verse 19, this is what he says. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Again, this is things that will happen in the great tribulation time. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. That's the second coming of Christ. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, from then till the second coming of Christ, you need to turn to Jesus. You need to receive him as your Lord and Savior, because all who will come call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, I don't know what you're waiting for. If you die without Christ, you're going to be lost forever. Uh, a gal came up after first service and said, can you pray for my family? My cousin just hung himself last night and died. And I asked, did he know the Lord? No. And she asked, where is he? Well, according to the Bible, he's in Hades. Does he have any chance to get out of there? No. You know, now's the time of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. You die without Jesus, you're going to be in the you're going to be in Hades, but then at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, it says even death and Hades are raised up. They stand before God at the great white throne judgment, and then everyone who has rejected the Lord will be cast into the lake of fire. So there's no second chances. The Mormon church will say, oh, you can accept our Jesus after you die. You know, and that's why they get in trouble praying for, you know, Jews. They get, they, you know, they're praying, dead people. I see dead people. But that's what they're doing. They're praying for the dead, giving them a second chance. There's no biblical example of that. It's now you need to get saved. Today is the day of salvation. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so Jesus, you need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. If you do, he will save you. He'll fill you with his Holy Spirit. He will give you eternal life. And that's why we need to be proactive and let people know the good news. Even if they don't like you, even if they think you're a fanatic, you don't have to paint yourself blue and orange. Just reflect the love of Jesus. You know, even at the end of the book of Revelation, one of the last things we read in the Bible is just God's heart towards those who need to know God loves them, and he wants to save them. Revelation twenty two seventeen. It says, The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's you and me, say, Come. Let him who, is, who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And so again, come to Jesus, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Now look at verse 22. Peter goes on and says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. You know, he's being very personal here. You guys, you saw him. Jesus was here for three and a half years. He traveled all over Israel. He came to Jerusalem numerous times. And you guys saw him do miracles. You saw him heal the sick. 
cast out demons, cleanse lepers, open up blind eyes. You saw him raise people from the dead. Just over the hill there in Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, not long before that. And, and the religious leaders wanted to kill not only Jesus for doing that, they wanted to kill Lazarus because he was a witness of who Jesus is and what he can do. And so he didn't do this in a corner. He wasn't off to the side doing these things. He was doing this all openly. Many of these people may have eaten the loaves and the, the fishes when Jesus multiplied them. But he says, he was here, he was in your midst, a man attested to, by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. So this verse speaks of both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of men. You did this. You killed him. And, and you know, he says here, you know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Here's the sovereignty of God at work. God knew from eternity past he was sending Jesus to be the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. So it didn't surprise God. He knew exactly what was going to happen to Jesus through his foreknowledge. He knows everything about everything. There's nothing that's going to surprise the Lord. But he, he puts a responsibility on these people. You're the ones that said, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Uh, I don't quote much from you know, John MacArthur. I mean, he leans towards the Calvinistic side of things. But this is a very... A uh, powerful statement. He says, quote, that the crucifixion was predetermined by God does not absolve the guilt of those who caused it. In other words, God's will is worked out. And as his will goes forth, we are going to be held responsible for how we react to what God is doing. You have a free will. And the easiest way to prove that we have a free will, that God created, here's sovereign God creating us little humans with a free will. It's in the book of Genesis, chapter 2. He created Adam and Eve. He tells them, of all the trees of the garden, how many? I don't know, millions of trees in the Garden of Eden. You can freely eat, except for that one. There's free will. That one I'm putting over here, the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. So don't eat of it. That's a, that was his desire, but he knew what they were going to do. You know, they were tempted by the enemy. They give in, and that day they surely died. But love requires choice. If God created us without a free will, then there is no love. It'd be like me asking Elizabeth to marry me with a gun to her head. Marry me or else. There's no free will. There's no choice in that. I mean, No. I was shocked that she said yes. <laughs> God's not shocked when you say yes to Jesus. But, you know, we, he's given us a free will. Now, Peter's not being very, you know, PC. You know, he, he's just laying it out there. You know, he's not holding back. I mean, he could have said this to any group, though. He goes, you guys killed him. But he could have said that to the Gentiles. I mean, he could have said that to the Romans. They're the ones that drove the nails into his hands. They put the spear up into his side. You know, you killed him. Well, he could point to the finger at us, too. I killed him. You killed him. How? Because of our sin. That's what Isaiah 53 is all about. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all turned each to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So it was my sin, my iniquity that put Jesus on the cross. And you can even go further because in Isaiah 53, it says it was God's good pleasure to put him on the cross and have him die for us. Ultimately, God put his son on the cross because that's how much he loves us. God demonstrated his own love toward us. And while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. He's our only chance. He's our only hope. So again, verse 23, Peter says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, 
having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that it should be held, that he should be held by it. And so in these two verses, we have the glorious gospel. He died, buried, and he rose up. Death could not hold him. He had to rise from the dead. He loosed the pains of death, it says here. He conquered death. He destroyed death. Look at these verses in Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 14, it says, In as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, that's us in our human bodies, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same. He took on human flesh. He was born of a virgin. He had a human body. He shared in the same. That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so he has broken those chains of death that were hanging on us. Those chains that were pulling us down into the pit. Jesus has broken those chains. He set us free. And the Apostle Paul says, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus says, and you know these verses in John, uh, yeah, John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then here's the question. Do you believe this? I mean, that's a question for everybody. And that's where you have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. That is your responsibility to believe in Christ Remember the Philippian jailer? We'll see him later on. I think it's in Acts 16. You know, he's about to kill himself. And he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's all we can do. Put our faith in him alone. Now again, Peter, who has the word of God in his heart, quotes from Psalm 16 here. Look at verse 25. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One, that means the Anointed One, that's the Messiah, to see corruption." You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. So here he says, you're not going to leave my soul in Hades. Again, when Jesus went into Hades, the grave, it was to set captives free. He, he, okay, he's crucified. They laid him in the tomb. And he went down into the lower parts called the abyss. Um the place where there was a chasm separating the place of torment from what? Abraham's bosom, remember? And Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. When Jesus died on the cross, as he's dying, what did he say to the thief who called out to him? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Where was paradise? In Hades. There was a place of peace and rest and comfort, and then there was a place of torment. And so Jesus goes out down there, and he proclaims, the good news to those who would put their faith and trust in the Lord in the Old Testament, he releases them from Hades. Hades wasn't all bad. There's a place of torment and paradise. Now paradise is up in heaven. So he released them. This is what we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But he, that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And so he emptied out paradise, transferred all believers to heaven. So now when you... And I, when we die as Christians, if this is before the rapture, when we die, we instantly go into the presence of the Lord. There's no holding place anymore. Down below, everyone now goes up into the presence of God. This is what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. I love this section. This is the Apostle Paul saying, For we know that if our earthly house, talking about these bodies, he refers to it as a tent, is destroyed 
We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Remember, Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's what he's referring to, resurrection bodies. Right now, these bodies are like tents. They're starting to flap in the wind. <laughs> Zippers are starting to break, you know, and so forth. <laughs> Don't need to go into great detail. You know what I'm talking about. So we have a house, a glorified place waiting for us in heaven. Verse 2, for in this... This tent we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. So we're not just spirit beings going to be floating around up there. For we are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. That further clothing takes place at the rapture. Dead in Christ rise first. Because the Lord's going to give them their resurrection bodies at the rapture. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. It says here in verse 5, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. If you're born again, the Spirit's in you, and that's the stamp of ownership. You belong to God. So we are also co always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We don't see him in his glory. Obviously, we're still in these bodies. But here we see in verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. And so by faith, we are confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So that's what we're all looking forward to, getting out of these bodies they're wearing down, falling apart, you know, going to eventually die if we're still here before the rapture. But we're looking forward to seeing him face to face. That's what it's all about. And that's what he's referring to here. We're going to see the Lord and we're looking forward to seeing him. So it says in verse 31, he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And so he's saying, 120 of us, we're witnesses. Paul says 500 witnesses saw him at one time, raised from the dead. And so, make no mistake about it, Jesus is alive, risen from the grave. Now, what's the evidence that Jesus Christ is alive in your life today? The Spirit is the guarantee is it speaking in tongues? No. What does Jesus say is the guarantee or the results of the guarantee of the Holy Spirit in you? He says it's love. That supersedes all the gifts. I show you a more excellent way, 1 Corinthians 13. He goes through all the gifts in chapter 12 and 14, but he says the more excellent way is agape love. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. Notice, by this, all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's the true mark of being spirit-filled, is that you have love for one another. You know, I've known Christians over the years, they'll speak in tongues, they'll go out of here, then they'll go right into sin. It's like, that's not, a, that's not anything, that doesn't prove anything. I believe tongues are for today, but that doesn't prove anything if you're going to go out and live like the world. You know, you can be in church, you can be singing to, to the Lord, and you go out here and just go into darkness. That's not God's way. That's not the, the Spirit working in you and through you. We need to let the Holy Spirit work in us and through us. And, and the evidence, the true evidence, is that we will love. Love one another. Love those who are lost. Paul says, it's the love of Christ that constrains me. He writes that saying, you know what, I've been beaten. I'll get run out of town. I'll go back into the town. I'll share the gospel with him. Why? Because he loved those people. Without Jesus, they're going to be lost and they're going to go to hell forever and never. And so it was the love that God put in his heart to continue to reach out to those who were dying in their sins. That's the true mark that you were walking in the fullness of the Spirit. Jesus said, but you shall receive power, chapter 1, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Witnesses of his goodness, his grace, his love, his compassion. Look at verse 33. 
Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. And so this is so wonderful because Peter now is letting them know this is the promise of the Father. Jesus spoke about it. Luke 24, 49, wait in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. He saw it, we saw it in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the promise of the Father. The Spirit will come upon them. Peter says, this is what's going on here. The Holy Spirit has now come upon us. Verse 34, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Again, this is where he's quoting from Psalm 110. He didn't know a lot about physics and mathematics and computer science. <laughs> he was just a simple fisherman. But the amazing thing about Peter, he knew the Word of God. And he had the Word of God in his heart. And God used him in tremendous ways. I would rather know the Word of God than anything else. I would rather know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior than know anything and anybody else. Because everything else in this world will pass away. The Word of God will endure forever. So here in this verse, Peter is quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1, which is one of the most important verses in the, in the New Testament, in the Bible, but it's the most quoted chapter, Psalm 110, in all the New Testament. And Jesus, or Peter's quoting that, referring to Jesus. In the Gospels, Jesus asked the Pharisees a very important question. He says to them, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said, oh, he's the son of David. And so Jesus said to them, how is it then that in the spirit, and this is where Jesus quotes this, how is it in the spirit David calls him Lord? He says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Then Jesus says to them, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? They knew the answer, but they refused to give him the answer because they knew what he was implying. How can the, the Lord be his, you know, how could David have a Lord who created him, but then also have a descendant, the Lord, after him as one of his sons, descendants? Well, the answer is Jesus is both God and he's man. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. As the offspring of David, he's going to sit upon the throne of David forever. That was the promise that you know, God gave to David. There'll be one who will sit on your throne forever. Well, after the Babylonian captivity, they had no king on a throne. They still don't. But that will be fulfilled when Jesus returns and he sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. He will sit upon the throne of David. And so they knew and they, they didn't respond to Jesus because they could not admit that he was both the Messiah and he's the offspring of David. He's both eternal God and he is David's descendant. The only person in all of history that could be both David's Lord and his son is Jesus Christ. And they were not going to give him that response, so they kept quiet. Only Jesus has combined within his nature Deity and humanity. He's fully God, fully man. And that was something the Pharisees refused to accept. So they didn't want, didn't want to acknowledge the fact that Jesus was, is the Messiah, their Lord, their Savior. And so by quoting this psalm, Peter's pressing them to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is their Lord and their Savior. He's the only way of salvation. So Peter says in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I mean, this is why the Holy Spirit came Jesus says he's coming to convict the world of sin, righteousness, judgment. Their hearts are being convicted right now. They're being convicted that we, we crucified our Messiah. We said, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. 
And now they're just like, oh, I can't believe we did that. The Holy Spirit's bringing their, you know, opening up their eyes to the fact of what they did. And so now they're like, what do we got to do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? The word of God, it's so powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And that's what's piercing their hearts. And so what does Peter say? Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. First and foremost, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, again, the promise of the Holy Spirit, is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. That would include us. We're about as afar off from Jerusalem as you can get. As many as the Lord our God will call. So the first thing he says, you need to repent. Change your mind about your Messiah. You thought Jesus was false. You wanted him crucified. So you need to repent of that thinking. You need to realize he is our Lord. He is our Savior. He's the one we got to put our faith and trust in. That's what repentance, repentance is. Changing your mind about what is a lie and then following the truth. A lot of people have remorse. Yeah, I'm sorry I got caught. I'll try not to do it again. But true repentance is... I'm going the wrong way. I want to go the right way. I've been going the wrong way with Jesus. I want to go the right way with Jesus. And so once you repent and you receive him as your Lord and Savior, then he says, now get baptized. Not for salvation, but you're identifying yourself with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. You go under the water, you're being buried with Christ. You come up out of the water, you're being raised up a new creation in Christ. It's a symbol that I am not ashamed of being identified with Jesus. So for the Jews in the first century, we'll see 3,000 are going to get saved here in a moment. When they would get baptized and they would come up out of the water, all their Jewish friends and relatives would say, I don't know you anymore. You're dead to me. That's what they would do. I'm not going to you know, trust you anymore. I'm not going to hire you. You're not going to work for me anymore. I mean, so they were kicked out. I mean, when you identify with Jesus in baptism, it was a big deal. We've kind of softened things over the years in our country, but we see this in India, when, especially with the former Muslims. When we baptize Muslims, and I've got to baptize a lot of Muslims over there that are now walking with Jesus. When they come up out of the water, if they have relatives there that aren't believers, they'll turn their back on them. You identify with him, we're not going to identify with you anymore. And so it's a big deal. You're, you're putting your life on the line, so to speak. But this is the promise of the Holy Spirit. If you come to Christ, He will give this promise to you, to your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, look at verse 40. And with many other words, so... It wasn't just, you could read through this sermon that's written here in about, I don't know, a minute and a half. And so a lot of people say, well, you talk too long, Jeff. You need to shorten it down. Um, you know, with many other words, you know, you'd be happy to know how much I didn't share today. I could add, there's a whole lot that I've kind of cut, cut it down here. Anyway, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation i mean it was perverse back then how, how much worse are we today i mean i think we per perfected perversion in our nation be saved from this perverse this wicked twisted is what the word means generation then those who gladly received his word were baptized in that day three thousand about three thousand souls were added to them and so Peter preached an amazing message explaining what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit's all about. He didn't talk anything about tongues. He didn't say, well, I'll tell you what tongues are all about. He didn't go, I mean, Paul will later on. But no, he says, this is that which was spoken of. This is an opportunity now to preach the gospel. We got your attention through the speaking in different languages, but here's the reason why you're all gathered here to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. He used it as an opportunity to tell the people it's all about Jesus. Joel chapter 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, it's all about Jesus, and you need Jesus for salvation, and that's what Pentecost is all about. 
We need more of the Holy Spirit so that we can be more like Jesus. Or as another person said, we need more of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit wants more of our lives so the world out there will see less of us. That's true. We must decrease. We want Him to increase. Amen? Amen. One final thought as I've talked about before when we went through Exodus, when Moses brings the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai, 3,000 Israelites are going to be put to death because of the law, because they were breaking the law. They were already worshiping a gold calf. But on the day when the Holy Spirit is poured out, because Jesus brings life, 3,000 people are born again. Awesome. We'll pick up here next time. We'll look at what the, the outline for the Christian church is all about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the gifts you've given us, the talents that we have. May we use the gifts and talents you've given us for your glory. We pray, Lord, that your Spirit would come upon us afresh and anew. We need to be refilled with your Spirit. We don't want to quench and grieve the Spirit anymore. If, Lord, we're walking in the flesh, then we're not living the way you want us to live. And the world's not getting a good picture of who you really are. And so I pray your Spirit would refill us overflowing, that rivers of living water would pour into our lives and flow out of our lives. Lord, we thank you that you have cleansed us of all unrighteousness. May we walk in that newness of life that you have given us. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so, Lord, help us, strengthen us, not to go back to those old ways, those ways that try to pull us down and bring us into discouragement and despair, depression. But Lord, may we walk in the newness of life that you have given us. We thank you for your word. May you give us a, a greater hunger for the word of God, that we might know you more, because this is how you revealed yourself to us, through your living word that we would depend upon you more and not the things of the world around us. Lord, we don't know everything that's going on behind the scenes in our nation, in this world, but we thank you that you know all things. You're omniscient. Lord, you are in control. You are sovereign. You know when the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet you, Lord, in the air. And we're going to be with you forever. But until that day, may you fill us up overflowing with the rivers of living water. We don't want to just settle for just a little trickle now and then, but we pray for your rivers of living water. We pray that your word would continually cleanse us. We thank you for the ongoing cleansing of the blood of Christ. Lord, we have no reason to remain dirty in this world. Thank you for giving us all that we need for life and godliness. And we give you all the glory for the great things you've begun in our lives. And we know you're faithful to complete those things in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.